first note written by the emperor on the back of Sir Hudson Lowe's letter dated 18th of November, 1817. This letter and the letters dated 24th July and 26th October last are filled with falsehoods. I have shut myself up in my apartment for 18 months in order to shelter myself from the insults of this officer. My health is now impaired and will no longer allow me to read such disgusting documents. Send me no more of them. Whether that officer considers himself authorized by verbal and secret instructions from his minister, as he has given us to understand that he does, or whether he acts of his own accord, which might be inferred from the care which he takes to act with disguise, I cannot treat him but as my assassin. Had they sent out to this country a man of honor... Not only I should have experienced fewer vexations, but they would have saved themselves many reproaches from Europe and history, which the farrago of writing of this crafty man will not deceive. Napoleon, along with the 23rd of November, 1817. Second note inserted in the margin of Sir Thomas Reed's letter to Count Bertrand, dated 25th of April, 1818. I told you yesterday when you presented this letter to me that I would not know its contents and that you were not to translate it to me since it is not conformable to the forms adopted for the last three years. Two, this fresh insult only dishonors that coxcomb. The king of England alone can treat with me on a footing of equality. Three, this crafty line of conduct has, however, an object to prevent you from disclosing the criminal plot which has been carried on for the last two years against my life. Four, it is thus that while they appear to open a channel for complaints... They, in fact, close every avenue. Five, thus, with the appearance of a wish to provide me with a house. And after announcing a building for the last three years, I am, however, still in this unhealthy barn. And no building is begun. Six, it is thus that whilst it appears that I am at liberty to ride on horseback, indirect means are resorted to to prevent me from doing so and from taking exercise, the one of which is the first cause of my complaint. Seven, the same means are resorted to to prevent me from receiving any visit. It is necessary for them to veil themselves in darkness. Eight, it is thus that after having attacked my physician, after having obliged him to tender his resignation, not wishing to be a passive instrument and deprived of all moral independence, he is nevertheless kept under arrest in Longwood in order that it may be believed that I have the benefit of his attendance when it is well known that I will not see him and that I have not seen him for the last fortnight. I never will see him as long as he is not set at liberty and freed from the oppression under which he is placed. And until he has regained his moral independence in what concerns the exercise of his functions. Nine, it is thus that a false representation is made by causing bulletins to be issued by a physician who has never seen me and does not know the state in which I am nor the disease with which I am affected. But that does very well to deceive the prince and the people of England and Europe. 10. A ferocious joy is manifested at the aggravation of sufferings, which this deprivation of medical assistance adds to my protracted agony. 11. Demand that this note be sent to Lord Liverpool, as also your letter of yesterday and of the 18th and the 14th of April, in order that the Prince Regent may know my blank and may cause him to be brought to public punishment. 12. If he does not, I bequeath the opprobrium of my death to the reigning house of England, Napoleon Longwood, the 27th of April, 1818. Document A. Protest addressed to the governor on the 22nd of July, 1818. In the name of Emperor Napoleon, I am enjoined to protest. One, against all violation of our enclosure by servants, workmen, or others whom you would secretly invest with public authority. Two, against the insults offered to Dr. O'Meara to compel him to leave this place. And against the obstructions, either public or secret, which you have opposed or may oppose to Napoleon's being assisted in his illness. 
by the advice of some medical officer in whom he may have confidence, who may be accredited in the service of his Britannic Majesty or known to practice publicly in the island. Three, against all testimonies, reports, and writings of the militia officer Hister, who is only placed along with to be an instrument of hatred and vengeance. Campetran. Document B to the Governor, Sir Hudson Low, Longwood, 23rd of July, 1818. Sir, I have the honor to transmit to you a letter which I have just received. The old man appears to me to be out of his senses. He can have no knowledge of my official correspondence, but by your orders, I have not answered him and shall not do so. He is only a subordinate agent at if his principal. A general officer wishes to demand satisfaction of me. I'm ready to grant it. I have the honor to be Count Bertrand. Document C, the governor to Count Montalai. Plantation House, 25th of July, 1818. Sir, I do myself the honor to state to you for the information of Napoleon Bonaparte that agreeably to the instructions which I have received from Lord Bathurst, dated the 16th of May, 1818, I am directed to move Mr. O'Meara from his situation near the person of Napoleon Bonaparte, and that I have accordingly given orders for him to leave long, but immediately Rear Admiral Plempin has received received at the same time instructions from the Lords of the Admiralty to remove him from his island, Lord Bathurst's instructions for the direct that after Mr. O'Meara's departure, I am to order Dr. Baxter to attend upon Napoleon Bonaparte as physician whenever he is requested to do so, and that I am to inform him that he is to consider the health of Napoleon Bonaparte as the chief object of his attention. On communicating this arrangement, I am strictly enjoined to state at the same time that if Napoleon Bonaparte has any any reason not to be satisfied with the medical attendance of Dr. Baxter, or if he prefers any other physician of this island, I am quite ready to acquiesce in his wishes in that respect and to allow any other medical practitioner whom he may select to attend upon him, provided he strictly conform to the rules established and now in force. Having given Dr. O'Meara the orders for his departure, I have furnished Mr. Baxter with the necessary instructions, and he will be ready to repair to Longwood at the first summons. In the meantime, until I am informed of the wishes of Napoleon Bonaparte on this subject, I shall order a medical officer to be stationed at Longwood to be ready in case of emergency. Hudson Low. Document date. Count Monsant to the governor. Sir, Dr. Amira quitted Longwood yesterday, being compelled to leave his patient in the midst of the course of medicine, which he was prescribing for him. That course has ceased this morning. From this morning, a great crime is in progress. Nothing remains to be added to Count Bertrand's letters of the 13th, 24th, 26th, and 27th, April last. The emperor will never receive any other physician than Mr. O'Meara, because he is the physician attached to him, or than the one who might be sent from Europe to him in conformity with the letter of the 13th of August, which has already been mentioned. I have communicated the letter you addressed to me yesterday. What I have now is the honor of writing to you is the substance of the reply I have been desired to transmit. Count Montalon, letter of Count Bertrand to his eminence, Cardinal Fash, Napoleon's uncle, my lord, the Sieur Cipriani, the Emperor Stuart, died at Longwood on the 27th of February last at four in the afternoon. He was interred in the Protestant burial ground of this island, and the ministers of their church have observed on this occasion the same rites that they would have performed for one of their own persuasion. Care has been taken that in the extract from the register of deaths, which I shall send you, Oh, this paragraph of my letter might answer the purpose. It should be stated that he died in the bosom of the Roman Catholic Church. The minister of the church of this country would willingly have attended the deceased on his deathbed, but the latter was anxious for a Catholic priest. And as we have none, he appeared to have no wish to see a clergyman of any other religion. I should be glad if you would let us know what is the law of the Catholic Church upon this point and whether a Catholic on his deathbed may be ministered by a minister of the Church of England. We cannot, however, sufficiently praise the proper feeling and the zeal which were evinced on the present occasion by the clergy of the island. Cipriani died of an inflammation of the bowels. He expired on a Friday and had attended his duties on the preceding Sunday without having any presentiment of his 
approaching end. A child of one of Count Monson's servants had died at Longwood a few days before. A waiting woman died some days ago with the same complaint, such as the effect of this unhealthy climate in which few men live to an old age. Liver complaints, dysentery, and inflammation in the bowels carry off many of the natives, but a still greater number of Europeans. We felt upon this occasion, as we feel every day, the want of a minister of our own persuasion, as you are our bishop. We wish you would send us out one, either a Frenchman or an Italian. You will, in that case, like the man of instruction, under 40 years of age, and especially of a mild disposition, and not imbued with anti-Gallican principles. The steward's duty has devolved upon Mr. Pierron of the household, but he has been very ill, and though convalescent, is still in a bad state of health. The cook is in a similar condition. It would be therefore necessary that either you or Prince Eugène or the Empress should sit out a steward and a French or an Italian cook taken from amongst those who have been in the Emperor's service or who may still be in the service of his family. Your eminence will find annexed one, the papers found in Monsieur Cipriani's folio, two, a brooch which he was in the habit of wearing and which I have thought it right to send home for his wife. Three, an account of all that is coming to him amounting to 8,287 francs or 345 pounds sterling for a bill of exchange in favor of his heirs for the settlement of that account. The emperor, knowing that his son is under your care and that his daughter is with madame, only delays securing an annuity to both his children, until he shall have been informed of the fortune left by Cipriani, who appears to have funds in Genoa, to a rather considerable amount. I will not afflict you by dwelling upon the state of the emperor's health, which is not satisfactory. It has not, however, become worse since the hot weather. I hope you will keep these details concealed from madame. Give no credit to the false reports that may be circulated in Europe. Consider as the only fact that may be relied on that for these 22 months past. The emperor has only quitted his apartment occasionally, though very seldom, in order to pay a visit to my wife. He has hardly seen anyone, unless it be two or three Frenchmen who are here and the English ambassador to China. I beg your eminence will present my respects to Madame and to the individuals of her family and accept the homage of the sentiments with which I have the honor to be Count Petrin. First letter of the Countless Causes to General Count Bertrand. I am going to devote to you the first moment that I can command. It is now upwards of a year since I quitted Logwood. And during that time, what troubles, what cares, what misfortunes of every kind have I not had to contend with? I leave it to the newspapers to give you an account of my tribulations. I shall avoid in my letters every expression, every subject that might afford a pretext for their being withheld from you. I will promote by all means in my power the only object I have in view, which is that you should receive from me the proofs of a devotedness that will occupy every instant of the remainder of my life. I have but two present to my mind, the consolation and happiness that I derived when in your company from European recollections, not to give all my attention to the object of procuring you that kind of consolation. Oh, my dear companions, who will henceforth engross my thoughts of every day and of every moment? I am therefore writing to you on the first instant of freedom that I enjoy from personal restraint. And regularly every month on the same day, I shall at least give you this token of my incessant anxiety for you. Obstacles, perhaps, over which I shall have no control may prevent your receiving my letters. But as far as regards me... Death alone can make me fail in my promise, and here I appeal to the feelings of those who, being entrusted with the censure of my letters, might fancy that they found in their expressions some motives for intercepting them. I beseech them to let me know of any involuntary deviations on my part that might appear reprehensible to them in order that I may avoid them for the future. The necessity and the consolation of domestic sentiments cannot be prohibited by public morality, and such are the only sentiments which I shall endeavor to gratify in writing to you. I have just obtained the asylum in 
Austria, which I demanded as soon as I found that my liberty was in danger, I shall repair to this so soon as the wretched state of my health will allow me to undertake the journey. The headaches which first attacked me at the Cape, daily increasing in violence, and give me much uneasiness. I shall avail myself of the free intercourse, which is henceforth allowed to me in order to procure some exact information respecting all those that may be dear to you. Today, I can only give you such information as I have been able to collect indirectly. My wife, who the greatest good fortune was, refused permission to go out to St. Helena at the very moment when I was leaving it, and who came to meet me upon the high road where I was carried about like a bale of goods is now on her return to Paris for when she will bring back the rest of my children. She will enable me to afford you some details in my next letter concerning your family and those of Montsalon and Gorgo. I have been able to ascertain that Her Majesty Maria Louisa enjoyed excellent health in Parma and that nothing can exceed the health and beauty of her son. Who is that Schoenbrunn? The Countess of Sevilla. Villiers is detained here by the very infirm state of her health. She occasionally receives news from her husband, who is quite well in America. Both her daughters are also well. The eldest bears a striking resemblance to the august head of the family, Princess Borghese, Madame, the Empress Mother, Prince Canino, Cardinal Fetch, and Prince Louis are at Rome. And in the enjoyment of excellent health, the remainder of the family, Princess Lisa, Count de Montfort, and Princess Mira reside in various parts of Austria. I hope that in time I shall be able to send you more direct and positive details. I feel the most bitter regret that I was not able to land and fix my abode in England. I am deprived of the means of procuring and sending immediately whatever I might have thought calculated to afford you some trifling diversion upon your horrible rock. This is a religious duty imposed upon me, which I have solicited and shall continue you every day to solicit the British ministers to allow me to fulfill my constant endeavors to persuade them upon that point will not allow me to despair of success. Nevertheless, however far I may be from this spot, I shall not fail to attain so sacred an object by the assistance of some intermediate person. Only you will receive the results of my cares and of all my efforts in a less complete manner and at a later period. Be careful, all of you, of your health. Live for the consolation, the affection, the happiness, and the wishes of those who admire and love you. I received upon my arrival at Dover a letter from you, dated the 22nd of July, and one of the 29th from Sir Hudson Lowe. They acquainted me with what was unknown to me until then, that you had received the few articles I had sent along with from they came, that you had received the document which was handed to me by you, and which I had returned respecting the money which, at my departure, I had presumed to lay at the feet of the emperor, and of which I was so happy as to procure the acceptance. Sir Hudson Lowe informs me that all the bills relating to this affair, which I had left in your hands, have been Negotiated. I hope that they have been duly honored. I know not yet myself the state of my affairs. I have not yet had it in my power to write a single line to my agent in London or to receive any news from him. I regret much that I have not in my power and at my command the narrative of the campaigns of Italy that distant epic already removed from the politics at the present day possesses henceforth all the merit of history it is anxiously wished for science and the contemporaries of that period claim it it should deem myself fortunate if that work were confided to my care, and in case you should procure the favor for me, I shall instantly take the means of taking advantage of it without delay by at once inquiring in London what are the previous formalities that would be required both in England and at St. Helena in order that I might receive that manuscript. I shall request that the reply that will be made to me may be likewise transmitted to Sir H. Lowe in order that you may judge whether there would be no objection on your part to do what might be required of you. Write to me, dear general, in your turn by every opportunity. Give me all the commissions that may occur to your mind, whether serious or trifling, easy or difficult. It matters not. Be well persuaded and constantly bear in mind that I live only for you and through you all. My body alone has left your rock. Countless causes 
letter of counsel's causes to Mr. Goldberg, Under Secretary of State, upon forwarding the above letter to him, Frankfurt, 26th of January, 1818. Sir, my wife has informed me of the extreme kindness with which you have, on different occasions, transmitted accounts to her in Paris of myself and my son, and in the name of Lord Bathurst, be pleased to accept the expression of my thanks and of my gratitude for this proceeding. If, as I am given to understand, you have, under Lord Bathurst, the directions of the affairs of St. Helena, may I be allowed to request you would guide me upon certain points relating to my correspondence of that island. Might I solicit of you in the name of all those sentiments that dwell in humane and feeling hearts that without departing from our own regulations you would second my religious intentions to afford some consolation and some attention to the sufferings that are endured on that island might i request that you will obtain from lord bathurst that he would inform me whether i may be allowed to transmit to log with such books pamphlets newspapers and other objects as i may think would be acceptable there and in case of an answer in the affirmative that you would be pleased to point out any person you might wish to name for selecting and purchasing them in London, as I would take nothing more upon myself than to pay the amount to your own orders. If in the open letters which I intend to address to you for St. Helena, you should perceive the most trifling phrase of a dubious import that may give you the least uneasiness, may I request that you'll take upon yourself to erase it, as I now give my consent to your so doing, in order that there may not arise any delight in their transmission, and that you will be so good as to communicate the objections to me. That I may not run the same risk on a future occasion. You may read, sir, in the letter which I have the honor to send you this day for Longwood, that I therein ask for a manuscript, the campaigns of Italy, which is quite far from the politics of the present day, but is precious for the history and for science. In the event of its being confided to me from Longwood, might I obtain the favor of you to procure its being forwarded without loss of time by prescribing forthwith to Sir H. Lowe the formalities that would be requisite on both sides to ensure its being transmitted to me? I am aware, sir, that in the midst of your many occupations, what I presume to ask may occasion to you an increase of trouble. Still, I am not without hope from the sanctity of the motives which impel me to ask that my request be granted. You will thus confer upon me the most lively and sincere obligation. It is with the view of being as little important as possible and thereby giving a greater facility to the attainment of my wishes that i have thought it right to address myself to you sir in preference of lord bathurst and in so doing i hope i have not transgressed the rules of propriety it would be quite innocent and against my intentions countless causes second letter of countless causes to count general bertrand Frankfurt, 26th of January, 1818. Faithful to my promise, I write to you after the lapse of one month and on the same day on which my first letter was dated. I have at heart to record the identical date so that you may depend upon its never being passed over without addressing you. Some passages, however, in my letter may perhaps be written subsequent to its date owing to the silence of Madame de las Casas, whose letters I was in daily expectation of receiving from Paris. It is now about a month since she left me. She proposed calling upon all your relations and upon those of General Scorco and Montsalon. She was to send me the most circumstantial details respecting them. To my great surprise, I have not heard from her. And as I do not wish to delay any longer writing to you, I am under the necessity of postponing to next month all the particulars, which I am quite certain she will have collected with as much zeal and as much care as I could have done myself. I have the satisfaction to know that my first letter has been forwarded to you. I had enclosed it in one of Mr. Goldburn's letters. His answer has just reached me. I acknowledge with real pleasure that it is filled with expressions of kind consideration. And as in all respects satisfactory, this leads me to hope that what had it there to 
taken place proceeded from mutual misunderstanding. He assures me other readiness that will exist at all times to forward my letters to you so long as they shall be of the same nature as at first and not liable to any greater objection. He adds that conformably to my request, the books and pamphlets I may point out will be sent to you. He offers to procure them and to superintend himself their regular transmission, taking care to remit to me from time to time a note of their cost in order that I may settle the amount. He informs me that in case the emperor shall think proper to confide to me the campaigns to Italy, Sir Hudson Law is forthwith to receive instructions to transmit them to England, for whence they will be forwarded and delivered to me in the matter that may be desired at long when after taking such cognizance of them as may be deemed necessary. Lastly, he apprises me that my papers which were seized in the Thames had been instantly sent back to me and opened, and that if I had not yet received them, which is still the case, accident alone could have occasioned the delay. I am therefore in hopes that you will receive some publications with this very letter. I am unfortunately at a great distance and unpleasantly situated for selecting them and for procuring them while new, but I will immediately write to London to remedy this inconvenience. I likewise hope that by the same opportunity I may be able to send you many things of which you stand in need or that may prove acceptable to you and others that may be of essential service to the emperor's health. Her Majesty Maria Louise is quite well and still resides in Parma. Her son, from a late account given by a person who had seen him at a juvenile ball, is remarkably handsome and is the delight of all Vienna. Such were the expressions used. He dances admirably well and is passionately fond of that amusement. All the members of the Empress family have evinced the kindness and most affectionate interest towards me. They have loaded me with offers and good wishes. I shall fortunately have it in my power to afford you regular accounts of them every month. Prince Joseph has caused me to be assured that his offers of service would know no other bounds than those of impossibility. He has given an asylum near his person to the worthy and virtuous plena who after our separation on board the Belrafin was tossed about by storms and on the point of perishing on the coast princess hortense informs me that she has suffered much persecution but that if the torments inflicted upon her have originated in the tender and respectful devotedness which fills her heart they are a source of pride and of happiness for her whenever my health will allow me i go to pay my respects to princess joseph who is confined to the most absolute retirement and chiefly to her bed by the bad state of her health. We talk of St. Helena. Our thoughts traverse the seas. Those are happy moments for us. Her daughters are quite well. Her husband from the very late accounts was likewise well. He had taken under his care two of the Emperor Napoleon's servants, which the British government had thought proper to. Retrench from the establishment of Longwood. Prince Lucien gives me an account of all those of the family who are assembled in Rome. Madame Cardinal Fesch, Princess Borghese, and Prince Louis are all in the enjoyment of good health and unite in wishes and prayers for the health and preservation of their august relative. As for Prince Lucien, he says he is happy in Rome. He has just provided advantageously for his three daughters, yet his mind and his heart are incessantly directed towards St. Helena. He can no longer reconcile himself to the idea of seeing his brother languishing and dying in his exile. He desires I will candidly tell him whether the emperor would be as happy to see him as he himself would be to appear before him. And conformably to his desire, I write to the British government by the courier who bears this letter to request they will allow him to proceed to St. Helena and to reside there a couple of years or for life if his brother does not send him away or with without his wife and children. His wife wishing to share in the honor of his exile and further to state that he will engage not to occasion any augmentation of expense either for himself or for his suite and that he will submit to the same restrictions that are imposed upon his brother and to any others that it might be thought proper to impose upon him personally either before his departure or after his return I cannot refrain, my dear general, from again requesting you will ascertain if the emperor would entrust to me the campaigns of Italy 
You might next forward to me those of Egypt. In their turn, they are both real treasures for the learned world and for history quite far into the politics of the present day and consequently not liable to any objection. I have written to London to convey the Countess Bertrand's thanks for the friendly recollections that were so kindly expressed towards her and the amiable attentions that were shown to her children. If I had had it in my power to remain in England, I should have endeavored to find out upon the spot some articles that I might have thought acceptable to the ladies at this distance. I can command nothing beyond my good wishes. They are very sincere towards them and towards you all, my dear companions, the fatal rock is ever pressed upon my heart. I am still far from being well. My headaches are daily increasing. The physicians are at a loss to give an opinion upon the subject. May God deign to preserve my health for the service and benefit of those who are dearest to my heart. I embrace you all affectionately. Take care of yourselves and may you enjoy good health. It will be my reward and the reward of your friends who love you as I do. Countless causes.